now, here is Tiki Fullerton on Your Money. Hello there, I'm Tiki Fullerton. Every night bringing you a full hour of the very best in business coverage across the nation and internationally, especially where business and politics meet. Coming up, White Gold CEO Jen Herdlicker talks through her stellar A2 milk half-year results with us direct from New Zealand as investors cream it with a 10% leap in the share price. Magellan's Hamish Douglas talks his results and big tech investment strategy with chief business reporter Leo Shanahan. And the most recent chairman of Britain's National Health Service, Malcolm Grant, shares his insights with us on the huge challenges ahead in health and how digital will transform business models. Well, I wish that Corrie McLaughlin and Howard Patterson were alive to see the results of A2 milk today. The scientists who first identified the A2 protein and how useful it would be. And the richest man in New Zealand at the time, who back, uh, back about 20 years ago, were on the right track. At a time when other companies like Blackmores are struggling with China, A2 Milk can only see blue sky ahead. A2 Milk's profit has skyrocketed up 55% to $153 million New Zealand dollars with strong demand in China. The company's infant formula holds almost 6% of the Chinese market with sales up 83% there as overall sales of the product were up 45% across all regions. Milk sales also saw strong growth, 12% in the established Australian market and up 114% in the newer US market as its distribution reach climbed to 10,000 stores. The company is forecasting second half revenue growth to be largely in line with the interim figures with earnings predicted to be slightly lower due to ongoing investment in marketing and brand expansion. But the company won't pay an interim dividend preferring to plough the upside back into marketing for growth. Well, for more on those results, I spoke with A2 Milk CEO Jane Herdlicker in Auckland a short time ago. Jane Herdlicker, these are stonking results. Now, the market was down uh, just before yesterday when people were worried about China. You do not see headwinds in China. We've just released uh, record financial results that are underpinned by very strong market share uh, record market share results, in fact, across infant formula, fresh milk in China, Australia, and in the U.S. And uh, so, so we're not seeing headwinds. We're in uh, we're in quite a good position, and each of our underlying um, or each of our businesses is in the best underlying health it's been in. So mm. we're very optimistic. Look, it's fascinating because you know we've obviously had Blackmores and seen the shock that they have got from increased competition in China, but you don't see any of that ahead either from a, a reduced uh, birth rate in China or from the new e-commerce rules. No, we're seeing a very different environment as we look forward, and I think it's a combination of things that are playing to. Um, to our favor. You know, one is we've got a, a unique brand that stands for something very special in the eyes of Chinese parents, particularly young moms. And um, that's as a consequence of the fact that we're providing, you know, one of the very best dairy nutrition uh, sources for them, uh, for the developing uh, babies and young children. And, you know, we're investing quite a lot to understand more about what's driving their behavior, what matters to moms, how we best position ourselves in market, um, how we communicate best with them, the mix of channels that they want to use. So we're investing quite a lot to be sure that we've got our settings right. We're also an ultra premium product in a category that's premiumizing, and that plays to our hand as well. So we see, you know, quite a lot of strong. Um, foundational elements to our position in the market that's setting us up very well for the future. So uh, crucial to this is getting the message through, I would imagine, about the A2 protein and uh, the, um, the, the health um, issues around that, the benefits. I'm wondering whether this is also a barrier to entry for, for others uh, in that it has to, you have to supply with a particular A2 herd. Well, it's an interesting thing, Tiki, because the, the essence of our success, I think, is that we've got a very strong brand that stands for something special. It's a product that's uniquely good. It's uh, obviously produced from cows that only generate um, the A2 protein. But for most of our consumers, they rep the, our brand represents to them a lot more than just being A1 protein free. So we're, we're that, plus we stand for uh, trust, 
um, fresh, natural, and we come from a very wholesome background, and we are a dairy nutrition company. We're not a pharmaceutical. So there are a lot of things that play to our favor, and I think mothers ultimately look at their children and say, this is a product that's really working for my child. Right. Uh, the other thing I think is interesting in these results is how well you've done across uh, Australia and New Zealand, uh, Australia, the fresh milk market. Our fresh milk sales in Australia are really impressive. Double digit growth again. We're 10 years in the market and we continue to go from strength to strength. Uh, we've built the premium category for dairy nutrition in Australia, and that's actually the backbone and foundation of our business. That's what gives us such strength, we believe, in infant formula. Okay, and uh, what do you make of uh, the Woolworths move on the $1 milk? And indeed, uh, Agricultural Minister David Littleproud uh, putting pressure on both Coles and Aldi today. Look, we think that the um, dairy farming community is very, very important to Australia and it thriving um, in the future is, is obviously critical. So we think what Woolworths has done is great. We obviously pay our farmers a premium um, for providing us A1 protein free milk and we, you know, we, we, we believe it's important to think about the farmers as well as to think about the consumers. Mm. Uh, so presumably uh, that, that, that price, even if it's sitting at $1.10, um, that's a long way from the premium prices that you're delivering here. Do you think that will make a difference at all to consumer preferences? Look, I really don't. I think consumers um, all appreciate that um, in order for there to be a future in fresh milk on shelves that um, dairy farmers need to have all the right incentives to be able to continue to afford mm. the investment in their properties and in uh, producing great fresh milk. So it's in everybody's interest that we've got a healthy industry for the long term. Uh, let me move to New Zealand and uh, crucial to your New Zealand business is this new deal with Fonterra, this giant dairy business. Uh, now, uh, the, the, uh, the beginnings of A2, of course, with Corey McLaughlin, Howard Patterson uh, was uh, very awkward and difficult with Fonterra, who refused to let A2 in. You've done this landmark deal uh, last year with Fonterra. How does that change your strategy? Well, we've got a great relationship with Fonterra now, and the opportunity that we have together in working uh, towards a mix of different opportunities that we've identified is significant. The relationship's strong, it will continue to get stronger. Of course, there's history, but um, the Fonterra leadership team today and our leadership team, we're just focused on the future. Mm. And we see quite a bright future, um, both in the existing products that we currently provide to market and then doing some interesting and new things with Fonterra. Yeah. Can you tell me any more about um, any further developments with that relationship and what that might mean for both the New Zealand market but also the Chinese market? Well, what we're announcing today is an important first step, and that is the development of milk pools. We're announcing the development of a milk pool in New Zealand, and we've already announced that we were building a milk pool together with Fonterra in Australia. And that's a really important foundation because it brings a farming community uh, in the Fonterra um, cooperative into the mix. And the first step for us is um, ingredient supply. That's to do some interesting new things. And uh, we, we've got a bright future together. We're not announcing anything more than the development of the milk pool and the start of ingredient supply. Okay, and what about the other two markets that uh, you have talked about, the UK and in particular, I guess, the US market in terms of, of growth? The US market, we continue to believe, is uh, a really significant opportunity. It's the second biggest consumer economy in the world. Today we have product in 12,400 stores across the United States and uh, that's a lot of fresh milk being sold to um, Americans who are, who are getting exposed to an A1 protein free proposition for the first time. Yeah. The brand is developing well there and the underlying momentum uh, behind our sales in store is great. So we're looking forward to continuing to build the brand and discovering what new things we might be able to do to help on the nutritional front in the United States.
Uh, Jane, you're not paying a dividend uh, this time round. Uh, you're very much ploughing uh, your uh, cash and, uh, into, into new investment in marketing. I see you, you bring, you've brought over Lisa Berquist from Jetstar and Qantas. Uh, you've got two more, your chief commercial officer, chief technical officer. You're really bumping things up there. Can you explain a little bit about your strategy in terms of marketing? We have a very big opportunity in China and in the U.S. to build our brand um, and build it for the long term. We see a big opportunity to expand brand awareness. We know how loyal our consumers are to Key, and it's important for us to build out awareness because that will drive the volume. Mm -hmm. So, and it's a multi-channel strategy for us in China, and that requires investment in market in China, which we've done in a small way in the past, but we now have the capability and the clarity on what we want to do to really do that in a way that will make a big difference. Okay, so what is We're that... looking forward to the next six months. It's a step-change environment for us. Indeed. So what does that do to your outlook um, in terms of uh, final uh, margins and, and, and final uh, bottom line for the full year? Well, we've, we've issued a very specific outlook for the year, um, which is um, you know, continuing strong sales growth. Um, margins will come back a little bit as we reinvest in the future. Mm -hmm. And all of that's important as we head into FY20 and, uh, and another strong year ahead of us. Okay. So we're, we're really um, positive about the outlook in China. And we see a lot of potential in the U.S. Final one from me, just one on Huawei, and obviously uh, there's, uh, there's reports uh, over the last 24 hours that uh, Chinese tourists are actually taking it out on New Zealand. You don't see the broader trade wars and the, and the issue around Huawei at all affecting anything going forward either? We're very focused on the things that matter in our business. There are lots of things around us that we can't control, but we're very focused on the things that matter in our business. And that starts with making sure we're really clear about how we make a difference for uh, young Chinese uh, babies and children developing. We provide the very best in dairy nutrition, and it's a, it's a really big responsibility for us to make sure that we've got the right level of supply coming into the marketplace to ensure that those needs are met. Mm. And then secondly, we're very focused with our Chinese partners and the regulator to make sure that we're building our business in the right way for the long term. And the combination of those two things is working very well for us. What are you hearing from your investors today? Uh, our investors are smiling today, as you might expect, <laughs> and um, you know, very interested to understand what the future might hold. Well, Jane Herdlicker, congratulations on these results. Very exciting for you. Thank you very much for your time. Thanks, Tiki. I'm sure those investors are smiling. After the break, sticking with the reporting season, and we'll get cross results for Woolworths today with the Australian's Eli Greenblatt next. You're watching Tiki on Your Money. Welcome back. Well, reporting season continues to roll out thick and fast. As we were saying, one of the bumper results coming out was the Magellan Financial, with net inflows in the first half soaring to over a billion dollars, boosted by rising management and performance fees, alongside a steady inflow of new retail investors. Funds under management now sitting at 35 percent to over 72 billion dollars. For more on those results and the outlook on what looks like a challenging environment for fund managers, Your Money's chief business reporter Leo Shanahan sat down with. Company CEO Hamish Douglas. Douglas, thanks so much for joining us. My pleasure, Leo. Now, look, it's a tough environment for fund managers globally, uh, and yet your results are showing you're getting almost 10% returns. People asking, how does he do it? Yeah, well, first of all, last year the Australian dollar depreciated somewhat, yeah. so we probably look at our returns in, in US dollars still compared to the market. Uh, our returns were very strong relative to the market last year. But taking the Australian dollar uh, depreciation out of it, they're probably not quite as flattering as, as that. So let's have some honesty uh, <laughs> here as well. You know, we design our portfolios to have downside protection uh, built into the portfolios. We're running up almost 20% cash uh, through the latter part uh, of last year. We had some individual stocks that did uh, very well. Uh, Starbucks had done uh, uh, very well. Microsoft had held up well. Uh, uh, HCA, which is the largest hospital operator in the United States of America, had done well. But overall, the portfolio construction to protect people on the downside, we tend to run much lower volatility portfolios than the market as a whole. 
Uh, so really it was the construction process holding up and plus some individual stocks performed fairly strongly and the cash that we were holding because we were very cautious uh, leading into the latter part of last year. Now obviously you have big exposure uh, to those FANG stocks. Facebook, uh, Apple in particular, how concerned are you about being caught in a China-US trade war? Yeah, well, first of all, US trade war, I would put Apple in that category mm. and I'd actually put our, our position in Starbucks in that and to some extent Yum Brands, which has a, the KFC business in, in, in China. All up, that adds up to about 12% of our portfolio. Uh, we actually trimmed our Apple position just before the, the first tariffs were announced uh, last year. And that was really to try and manage our position. But in the context of the size of our portfolio and the percentage that those stocks represent, overall, we're not overly worried about the outcome uh, of the trade dispute in terms of our overall portfolio. But you're right, Apple could get affected, but it's one stock out of sort of 21 stocks uh, in the portfolio. Facebook, really, its issues are much more privacy related and fake news related. It's really not a trade war issue that is affecting Facebook. And what about ongoing concerns about Facebook privacy? Well, we're, we've held our position in, in Facebook and it's up very substantially since we purchased our, our, our Facebook holding. So that needs to be put in uh, context. You do get volatility and when you ever get very, very powerful business models, you do have to think about the regulatory risk attached with them. So this is really a regulatory risk and we're, we're obviously having to assess the likely regulatory intervention that Facebook is going to face. Uh, they have faced it in Europe. There's something called the GDPR, the General Data Protection Regulation, uh, that went through last year. It's actually had almost no impact on user growth or engagement within Europe, yet it's probably the most comprehensive privacy law um, the internet companies have ever faced. Are we expecting more of those type of regulations around the world? Yes. Do we think they'll model the type of European template? Yes, we do. Do we think they're going to be more draconian? No, we don't. Has it had a big impact on Facebook other than sentiment at some point? No, it hasn't. The big issue for Facebook is actually the whole fake news, the spreading of fake news, and how accountable that Facebook is for that and whether or not they can get ahead of it by investing in checkers and artificial intelligence to effectively take down a lot of that content uh, that caused particularly the 2016 presidential election was probably the, the highlight of that, maybe the Brexit vote uh, in the UK. I think they're making very substantial progress on cleaning up their platform, but they're not there yet. So we're watching that very carefully. And also, I, I travel to Washington a lot. There is not a lot of appetite in the United States to start regulating Facebook on those, on those issues at present. That means it won't happen. But we think Facebook's doing enough to get ahead of some of those, um, uh, some of those issues. Underneath it, Facebook has one of the world's best business models uh, the world's ever uh, seen. So we weigh up those risks. And what about Europe? Have you been watching, obviously, pretty carefully uh, regulation in Europe, people talking about a Facebook tax? Yeah, well, that, that's a new copyright directive that's coming in in, in in Europe. How accountable and responsible are they going to be for material that's put up in their, on their platforms, such as YouTube and on search results, for which may be copyrighted material? We haven't seen the final draft of that, and it hasn't actually passed all the European... Uh, parliaments, but what we've seen in the drafts uh, from that regulation, we're not overly concerned that it's really going to hamper uh, Google's business model. It may well hamper smaller players uh, in the market who don't have the resources to monitor uh, this, but they're going to have to use their best endeavours to take down copyrighted material where they're told about that copyrighted yeah. material. But we haven't seen the draft that looks like where it's headed. You ask on news is, the news, yes, there's a link tax potentially that they would have to pay the newspaper agencies to actually put up their content, but they can show very small snippets. And where it's happened before, what they've done is they've effectively said, well, we're not going to show the news at all. And in the end, all the, all the traffic stops flowing to the news site. So I think there will be, they will have to pay something to the news agencies probably for more snippets. But I think there's a fairly fair commercial discussion uh, between Google and the, and, and the news providers. So again, in the scheme of Google, we're not overly concerned by that, nor does that type of regulation surprise us. Let's talk about that bout of volatility last year. The Fed Reserve has now indicated it won't continue to lift rates. Uh, do you think that markets will settle in the next six months? Yeah, well, we're very cautious about what the outlook is for the next six to 12 months, maybe even for the next 18 months. We're in a very, very unprecedented 
uh, point in history. Uh, the Federal Reserve, end of January, did a complete backflip on the monetary policy and appears to put any rate rises on hold, maybe for a minimum of six months. The markets have been uh, very appreciative of that and we've seen very, very strong rallies in markets and I would say very strong rallies in very risky parts of, of, of the markets at all. Does that mean that we're not at the end of an economic cycle and monetary policy isn't going to tighten? I think you'd be uh, very ill-advised to suddenly think this calm we've suddenly got and this market rally we've had in the first few months of, of this year is an indication where we're sort of in clear waters. But certainly the US Federal Reserve has handed the punch bowl back to markets. Um, what happens in six months and what they have to do is one of the great unknowns and I think people should have some caution at the moment. But you're right, the Fed has stepped in to support markets uh, at this point in time. Now, to return to Australia and your results, uh, they were great results, record results, uh, but your retail arm is really booming at the moment. What kind of investors are you seeing in retail? Where are they investing and what do those investors look like? Well, this hasn't been built up just over, uh, no, overnight over no. the last year. It's been really built up over the last decade. If we split our retail business down, the largest part of our retail business, and we have about 20 billion of our 74 odd billion in funds under management in, in retail, uh, funds under management in Australia. Uh, of that, the vast majority of that currently is sitting with what we call financial advice groups. So they're large financial planning groups. In their model portfolios have their clients inside using particularly our global fund but also our infrastructure fund as investment options. And that's a vast bulk of what we, uh, of what we have. But we've been building up outside of that market uh, really in the listed market for self-directed investors, people who aren't using financial advice or maybe just using a stockbroker in a more limited capacity. And a number of years ago, we launched what we're known as active ETFs, um, an exchange traded fund that is actively managed. And that, that's ours. It was one of the first that had ever been done in the world. Um, and now we have, you know, one and a half billion dollars in active ETFs. And we listed a trust last year called the Magellan Global Trust. We raised again a bit over one and a half billion dollars for that trust. So we have over three billion dollars building up in what we would call in a very large unit base in more self-directed investors. So you could really split our retail business into financial advice clients. And we've actually got a very large business there and an emerging business with with individuals who are making their own decisions and obviously we're speaking to them about maybe diversifying part of their uh, uh, savings assets or their superannuation assets if they're self-managed superannuation into global equities. There's also been a lot of talk about you guys entering uh, retirement phase products, uh, basically annuities products. Uh, any further development with that? Yeah, well, we, we haven't said too much on it publicly. It's been worked on by a number of years by our Chief Executive Brett Cairns and Patty McCrudden, who's Head of Data Science and Retirement Solutions at, at Magellan. We, we understand that there is, with demographic shifts, there is a huge amount of money that is shifting out what is known as the accumulation phase, pre-retirement savings into post-retirement savings, when people start drawing down the income from the savings they built up. And traditionally, people will put their money into fixed income and maybe annuities in that space, but there's been very, very little innovation in sort of retirement savings products literally for 30 years. Mm. And what we've been doing is, is, is working on a solution that we think uh, is filling a void in the market. Uh, I don't want to go into too much detail, but we think it has a lot of innovation behind it. We're not there yet. Obviously, we're having to speak to the regulators and other things like we did with our active uh, ETFs, but there is a huge shift of money into that, into that space. So we want to bring a different style of retirement product to the market that we really think meets a very large unmet need uh, in the market. We're probably at least six months away from uh, saying more on that, uh, on that uh, publicly, um, but we have confirmed that at our results that that's been worked and, on. And finally, speaking of retirement, you certainly haven't retired, but you're, you're in a new role as a chairman. How, how are you enjoying that? I'm loving it. At the end of the day, you know, as a co-founder of the business, my primary role has always been chief investment officer and being the lead portfolio manager on our global um, equity uh, products. Um, that is my 90% of my job of what I, uh, what I do. I've worked with Brett Cairns. He's been a director for over 10 years. He's been sitting as an executive. He was executive chairman working very closely together for the last four years or, or, or so. We effectively just flipped the more of the administration roles all report through to him. He's doing a wonderful uh, job. It's freed up a bit of my time, probably about six hours a week has been freed up. That's valuable. Uh, people would say that's almost a day. The way I work, it's probably half a day. 
um, uh, of my uh, of my time, but it's it, it, it's valuable and incremental. And Brett's doing a fantastic job as chief executive. All right. Well, thanks so much for joining us. A pleasure, Leo. After the break, Eli Greenblatt from the Australian joins us next. This is Tiki on Your Money, covering the big business stories. Welcome back. Diving into reporting season now, and BHP has posted an 8% slide in first half underlying profit to 3.7 billion US dollars, missing analyst estimates. Still, the company delivered a higher than expected interim dividend of 55 US cents a share. CEO Andrew McKenzie says the company's focus on portfolio simplification, cash generation, and capital discipline delivered higher cash returns to shareholders. The mining giant is the first of Australia's big three iron ore producers to front the market after the Vale Dam disaster in Brazil last month. The tragedy saw more than 150 deaths and caused massive supply disruptions, leading to a spike in iron ore prices. Fortescue Metals' half yearly profit fell 5%, but shareholders will still be paid a special dividend. Weaker demand from China offset higher prices and production. Net profit came in at 644 million compared with the 681 million a year ago. The figure, though, beat some estimates, including that of UBS. Net debt was a $3 billion at the end of December. The company declared an interim dividend of 19 cents a share and a special dividend of 11 cents. Now to retail. Now Woolworths set to return up to $1.7 billion of capital after the sale of its petrol business. This, as it reports, a 1% rise in first half profit to $979 million as comparable food, food sales slowed from a year earlier. Sales from continued operations rising over 2% to $30 billion, weaker than expected following the removal of those single-use bags. Supermarket giant saying while the comparable sales for the first part of the second half have improved modestly following settled weather, the market is set to remain challenging. With cost pressures remaining a headwind and the consumer environment seem to be subdued for this foreseeable future, investors set to get an interim dividend of $0.45 cents a share. Well, for more on Woolworths and a few other retailers to come, the Australian senior business reporter Eli Greenblatt joins me from Melbourne. Eli, uh, nice, to, nice to see you there. We've had Coles and now Woolworths this week. Take us through Woolworths first. Uh, how did you see those results? That's right. We've had the two big retailers out already. So the Woolworths result was, was rather flat, and I think analysts were quite disappointed. I think investors were quite disappointed. And Woolworth shares fell about six and a half percent this morning when mm. the result was revealed. I think you know the, the Australian supermarkets division, which is the which is the flagship, which is the real earnings driver, was okay. It was you know it was slightly better. Um, so sales are improving, and you know Brad Banducci, who's been there two or three years now, he's really starting to turn that supermarkets division around, uh, where it was being beaten about the head by Coles. They're now trying. They're now really becoming a real challenger back to Coles. But I think the mm. surprise. Uh, the bit of the shock was the earnings fall at Dan Murphy's and the, and the drinks division. For so many years now, I'd say a decade, even two decades, Dan mm. Murphy's has been a real powerhouse for Woolworths. I'd say Dan Murphy's, maybe along with Bunnings, is one of the best retailers in the country in terms of year after year of profit growth. And yeah. we had a, about a 6% fall in earnings for liquor, for the liquor arm, which is mostly no. Dan Murphy's. Yeah, and it was, it was a bit of a surprise and I think a bit of a shock and people are not too happy about that. Yeah. Now, why do you think that is? I mean, you also uh, wrote about uh, people uh, mm. coming off the very expensive champagne, going for cheap bubbly these days. It's, is it, is it mm. consumers pulling back, do you think, on the grog? It seems to be. Um, I think mm. if the French aren't uh, unhappy already, it's, uh, we're, we're <laughs> starting to buy less of their champagne. Um, there's lots of issues there that was thrown in by Woolworths. There was weather, the cold weather and inclement weather. And as you can imagine, when it's cold weather, people drink less beer, uh, mm -hmm. especially in the summer months, uh, dr drink less alcohol. Uh, there's been a shift to more healthy drinks, um, a, a shift away from alcohol, people moderating their drinking habits. So this really hurt Dan Murphy's. Uh, people were also drinking cheaper drinks. And what they were saying this morning, what Brad Banducci was saying, is that there, is been, there has been a shift where people are um, trading down from champagne uh, into cheaper Australian sparkling wine. Now that's great for our Australian producers and we make great sparkling wine, uh, but they're, they're buying less champagne. He put that down to, in some effect to the wealth effect, to the feeling of affluence. You've got sliding property prices, you've got increasing cost of living, increasing energy bills. So yeah. if you do want to drink, um, you'll, you'll, you'll maybe forget champagne, go for the sparkling, well, which is a lot cheaper. 
What about the other drink uh, to make news this week, and that's milk? Mm. Well, and that's a whole big issue in itself. Uh, that seems to be a political battle as well as a consumer battle. Mm. Woolworths perhaps quite sneakily put out just the day before the Coles results that they were going to lift, uh, withdraw their dollar litre per milk and now have a dollar twenty with the money, the extra money to go back to the processors and hopefully then the farmers. Coles uh, and Aldi, it should be said, have not reacted yet. They're keeping their very cheap milk, uh, the dollar milk. And in fact, I think Aldi sells milk even just a bit below a dollar per litre. Um, so Woolworths got some brownie points for that and a pat on the back from the politicians, mostly National Party politicians, as you can imagine. Yeah. Uh, but some uh, farmers and some uh, country politicians not too happy at Coles and Aldi and kind of almost calling for a boycott against them as they stuck to their kind of dollar milk. And yes. that's just another battleground. OK, so uh, Woolworths, um, you know, shareholders must be happy, presumably, about the capital return uh, that they're mm. getting. But how do you see this going forward? I mean, this, this is still a very aggressive market, Coles, Aldi, Woolworths, because uh, Coles obviously now a separately listed company. Mm. Who's, the, who's, going to, who's going to come through this, do you think, strongest? Right. Well, it's incredibly, it's incredibly tough, and they're all fighting for every customer, for every wallet, mm. for every purse to get them in the store, doing everything they can. Coles had that uh, shoppables collection last year. They're now doing the stickies things. They're throwing everything they can to get the shoppers in, including reducing their prices. But that, of course, hurts their margins. You've got Aldi coming in with their um, refurbished stores. And, of course, you've got Kaufland coming in maybe end of the year next year mm. to upset them all. And Costco also there, of course, uh, um, also kind of tightening their grip on shoppers. Uh, I think it's going to be an incredibly tough market, as Brad Banducci said, a subdued market. And when you've got consumers yes. counting every dollar for the most, cent for the most times, um, it's going to just be an incredible fight. And even you had the Coles chief executive a few days ago, Stephen Kane, when I was talking to him about milk, he said uh, they found that when they put the price up of milk by 30 cents, with that 30 cent milk levy to help farmers out, there was actually a fall in volumes. So as much as people are passionate about helping farmers and want to help farmers, when that price of milk goes up by 30 cents for a three litre bottle, yes. the volumes go down. It's hard uh -huh. out there. Right. Not that helpful. Um, OK, yeah. so b briefly, uh, we've got, uh, of course, the my result coming. What are we to expect? Yes. Well, that's going to be really tough. I think it could be quite awful. Uh, oh. But you know, tomorrow we've got Coca-Cola Amatol, and that yes. will shed light on how soft drinks, tra uh, uh, soft drinks are going and beverages. Uh, uh, West Farmers, of course, with Bunnings. Uh, Bunnings has been struggling a bit in some of the kind of um, volatile weather conditions. But then you mentioned Maya, Tiki, but we've, that, and that's absolutely right. They're coming down the, the pipeline, I think, next month. But David Jones, late tomorrow night with their half-year results oh, out of yes. South Africa, they're struggling, they're hurting. They've lost the CEO of David Jones under mysterious circumstances. They've lost two of their Australian-based uh, directors under mysterious circumstances, including Gail Kelly, former boss of Westpac. Uh, so David Jones will come out late tomorrow night. And I think you would probably say that where David Jones goes, probably Maya follows. So that department store sector is really struggling. It's, it's going to be, I think, perhaps quite painful. Eli Greenblatt, stay in touch. Your uh, eyes and ears on this. Thank you yeah. so much. Thank you. Right now, let's go to the economy. Wages grew just 0.5% in the fourth quarter as concerns mount over the nation's economic outlook. As expected, wages grew by just 2.3% over the year. Wages growth remains mired in near historic lows, and economists today say that today's disappointing data will add to calls for the RBA to cut interest rates this year comes after the central bank aired its concerns over the impact of low wages growth in the minutes from its latest board meeting. Well, for what to make of all that data, Ben Udi from Capital Economics joins me live from Bloomberg in Singapore. Uh, ben, yes, this wages data is uh, not much cause for optimism, really, is it? No, it's, it's not particularly encouraging. Um, quarterly quarterly wage growth slipping back from 0.6 to 0.5 particularly is of concern. Uh, annual wage growth managed to stay the same but still came in below the RBA's target of 2.4 or forecast of 2.4. Uh, so things, things aren't looking great. Right, okay. So what do you think the Governor of the Reserve Bank 
is thinking right now as he sees this sort of data coming through? So the governor has made his, made his view clear that he doesn't like to react too strongly to one data point, and I think he'll stick to that uh, on today's data. But he's, he's going to be starting to get a little bit worried nonetheless. Um, he'll be hoping for some more positive news tomorrow with the uh, unemployment. But if he doesn't see uh, wage growth pick up soon, he'll, he'll have to start thinking about his options. Right, OK. Well, of course, uh, that, that jobs data, the unemployment data, so important. He's actually uh, really made, uh, made it pretty clear that that's the, that's the number that he's looking at where he's most sensitive. Uh, where do you see it landing this week? Hmm. Yeah, so tomorrow probably going to stay at 5%. That's uh, unemployment. Um, but employment growth is probably going to slow to... 2.0% down from 2.2 in uh, the previous month. Mm. So things are slowly uh, getting a little a little softer in the labour market, or the the improvement in the labour market is starting to come off. Uh, we think, but if the the governor is hoping that things will turn around, uh, that unemployment will continue to tick down over the course of 2019 and that's just not where we see things going. Okay, so going out this year, do you think there will actually be a move in rates and will it be down? Yeah, we're expecting one rate cut in 2019, probably towards the end of the year once the uh, economic deterioration becomes a little bit more clear uh, and then probably another one in early 2020. Right, and so the thinking is that after the trade wars hopefully are resolved, after a New South Wales election and a federal election, we get that out of the way, uh, that volatility disappears, a couple of uh, rate falls, and then we should be right and ready to take off again. Is that right? Yeah, hopefully things can uh, start to turn around after that. The housing downturn should hopefully start to ease with uh, lower interest rates, encouraging people to get back into the market. Uh, hopefully at that point the global outlook has started to firm up a little bit and then things can take off again. Right, okay. Well, sounds pretty dark the rest of this year. Ben Yudi, thank you so much for joining us. Well, after the break, what could Australia learn from Britain's healthcare system? So Malcolm Grant, former chairman of NHS England, next. Welcome back. The media will be doing more and more on the health sector. Just how we should fund health care in future makes your head's head hurt. It certainly does mine. Uh, digital health will be a game changer for health delivery and analysis, but it also carries risks, of course, around personal privacy and cyber threats. Well, one man who's been at the centre of it all in the United Kingdom is Sir Malcolm Grant as the first independent chair of the NHS, Britain's famous National Health Service. Recently discharged into the community himself, as he puts it, he's now the Chancellor of York University. We spoke earlier today. So Malcolm Grant, great to talk to you. Now, you say health globally is still a cottage industry, uh, a basket weaving uh, back in the 18th century. What did you mean? If you look globally, um, we've got emerging healthcare systems in various parts of the world. We've got incumbent healthcare systems in Australia, New Zealand, Canada, the US, and the UK. They're all quite different, and some of those differences as a result of cultural and political influences in those countries. Uh, but they share one common characteristic, which is they're not joined up in the way that you'd expect a modern industry to be. This is the biggest service industry in the world by far, and it's going to grow and grow and grow as more and more populations come into an economic environment in which healthcare becomes demanded, and also with aging populations around the world. Mm. Can you give us a sense of how big it actually is in England? The health service in England spends uh, around at the moment about 120 billion pounds uh, per annum. But this is actually quite cheap by global comparisons. We're spending about, I guess, 4.2 thousand uh, US dollars equivalent. Uh, Australia's slightly ahead of that, but not too dissimilar. 
But in England, what, about a third of the budget? Yes, about a, no, about, about a third of government expenditure is on health. And um, health then starts to crowd out other important government expenditure. It starts to crowd out social services. It crowds out education, transportation, other things that government needs to be doing yeah. because the demand for health is almost unavoidable. So we do need to find ways of taking the cottage industry aspect out of it, joining it up, using modern technologies in a way which will simplify, make health care more accurate and more focused and more precise. At a structural level, there's a, a real challenge, isn't there? Because GPs are presumably paid per capita, per head, and uh, hospitals are paid per activity. Now, how can this be resolved? There's quite an odd dilemma there. I th it is resolvable, and we're working hard to resolve it. Uh, one of the big problems at the moment, we've got a fantastic GP workforce, but they're getting quite submerged by demand, and particularly from an elderly population. You know, GP's delight was often dealing with a young family, following them through, tracing them through all the childhood illnesses, and hopefully nothing too serious. Much of the conditions that affect an older population are forensically really complicated, intertwined, and difficult. So what we're trying to do now is to avoid that population ending up in a hospital bed unnecessarily because of the complexity of their condition and joining up hospitals and GPs in some cases through some sort of model of horizontal integration what services can we take out of the expensive and care environment of a hospital and put into a GP's uh, surgery yeah and make it outcome oriented but how do you do that well, it's not too difficult theoretically, and <laughs> practically it's really complicated. I mean, it's, it's not too difficult theoretically to shift the services. We've done that with diabetes care to, to a large extent already, uh, and we can do it with many other conditions. Uh, what's much more difficult, I think, is to attune that to outcomes. You know, it, it's inevitable, isn't it? Our focus in healthcare systems is always going to be on the people who are really seriously acutely ill. And so we pile the money into the hospitals and try to ensure that they get the best possible care. It's much more difficult to say why did that person get ill in the first place and how can we shift resources back upstream to prevent the deterioration in health or the accident or other injury that they've uh, that they've suffered that's I think politically the difficult choice we know that our hospitals will only survive economically if we can succeed in reducing the demand for people who turn up in the emergency room, the demand for people who are admitted to hospital, and we have better facilities in the community. There's nothing new about this. Mm. What is new is how we go about changing the funding streams to bundle the contracts, uh, to move into a model in which there's a collective responsibility between GPs and hospitals to improve the quality of the health of their population mm. and to improve the quality, therefore, of their care. Driving so much of health, obviously, is politics, political influence. Now, you were actually, in 2013, made the inaugural chair of NHS England, uh, in part so that you would be independent, I guess, in terms of allocating funds. Now, how successful has this been? I think very successful on some fronts, less on others. I think in terms of allocating funding, really successful, we've depoliticized that. So we're an independent board at arm's length from government. But in terms of day-to-day -day running of the NHS, um, I think we've struggled and both we and government have had to do an elaborate footwork around each other. Um, and I have to say, well, based on you know, respect on both sides for the conditions which limit how we can work. But we've also been able to, I think, determine the future of the NHS as an independent body of the NHS, as opposed to being vulnerable to a new every incoming politician with a different view of what should be happening. That's been critically important because with a huge system like this, remember, we're serving 55 million patients, uh, 1 million patient contacts a day. Um, it's very vulnerable um, to political changes, uh, to destabilizing it, when what we've been having to do is to try and keep it focused. You talk too about the importance of keeping clinicians very much at the front of things, uh, but it is slow progress. The breakthrough you see is, is digital. I think we are just in the very early stages of a digital revolution. It's quite late coming to healthcare. It's transformed so many other areas of industry. And there are good reasons why it's late coming to healthcare. I think one of them is uh, trust and sanctity of data. 
Uh, the public are rightly really concerned about how their data is used and being able to see how it's used and be able to control how it's used and also to protect it against unauthorized use. So that's a pressure that's coming in one direction. In the other direction is the extraordinary power that data can bring to healthcare. And I sometimes think to myself, people are dying because we've got an asset sitting alongside us that we're not using, which is data. We know that through those data we can understand how patients in this condition have been treated and recovered in other jurisdictions even, in other countries, and we assemble the data. Now, this has always been done by clinicians, obviously, because they have international conferences and talk to each other, but the greater precision of being able to use real-time data uh, to treat this patient precisely is, I think, a minefield for the future. Sorry, not a minefield, a goldfield. Yes. A goldfield for the future. And at the forefront of this will be genomics, undoubtedly. Understanding. You've been very involved with genomics. So yes. what, what do you hope it will achieve? I think um, genomics gives us the capacity to understand much more clearly the impact which our inherited genome has upon our life course. Yeah, and everyone, not, not just uh, rare diseases. Well, yes, we've started with rare diseases because it's much easier to identify how this patient's genome varies from a standard genome, uh, which it may do in a million ways, by the way, but then to identify which of those variants may be responsible for a particular condition and then compare it with patients around the world with, with that same condition. But we can see uh, that as this develops, it will become highly influential in cancer treatment, which I think will be the significant breakthrough. Uh, not only in treating patients with cancer, but earlier and earlier detection of the growth of cancer cells in the human body. I think this is the next big um, objective of the process. Mm -hmm. We can use modern science at a molecular level to be able to identify early the causes and the conditions of disease in individuals. And AI more broadly, I read in the a AFR today that uh, my health really is leading the way in the world in some ways. How will AI transform things and uh, should we be worried about privacy? Two questions there. So how will AI transform things fundamentally? Um, because we have wealth of data about patients. Of course, we have huge patient records in all of our countries already which are digitized. Mm -hmm. uh, we can use machines to read those data and to provide us with diagnostic assistance that otherwise we, we cannot possibly generate. I think the second area is going to be pattern recognition, at which machines are particularly good and accurate. So we now know that they will bring about fundamental change, I think, in radiology, probably also in pathology as we go from a cell-based model of pathology to molecular pathology. And presumably even collating data within a hospital about a case would be that much faster. Yes, all, all of that. Um, I mean, there are great concerns if you feed the algorithm with the wrong data or the data that you feed it with are somehow biased against a particular ethnicity or gender. We've got to make sure that we know what's going into the box. Yes. We also need to understand what's happening within the box, within the algorithm. You cannot, I think, have a pure black box model of AI with an answer at the end that nobody can understand the process by which it was arrived. Mm -hmm. And finally, we have to understand that AI in the clinic has to be a clinical as assistant to a clinician as opposed to the final determinant of decisions. However, in practice, that is probably where it's going to end up because of the greater accuracy of AI. Should we be worried about cyber security? I mean, the NHS, you had your own scare with WannaCry. Uh, what are the lessons from WannaCry? I think we should be deeply worried about cyber. And um, uh, following that experience, we, we, we took a large number of actions to protect our systems and to make sure that all software and all patches were up to date across the whole system. Yeah, because your core was OK. Our, our central core, which handles as many transactions a day as MasterCard and Visa combined, remained absolutely unviolated. And that was a very good learning lesson for us as well. However, um, there's no system that I yet know of that is ultimately completely protected from cyber hacking. It may be that one day we get into quantum computing and to blockchain handling of data, which will give us that ultimate protection, but we're not there yet. We have to take every possible precaution against it, and it's not just hacking of a local cowboy sort. This is a global industry.
And also putting the power of data in the individual's hands. I think putting the power of the data in the individual's hands is tremendously important. Um, and that will safeguard that patient's data uh, if it's done properly because they actually control the data and who has access to it. Uh, but of course we also want to be able to use the data on an aggregated basis so that we can understand population health and do research on populations at large. I think the big risk is that um, and once d data does become aggregated, so it is much more vulnerable uh, to cyber hacking uh, than when it's held individually by a person. Another big disruption, Sir Malcolm, is uh, Brexit. Now, what would a no deal do to the British health system? Well, I think deal or no deal is the big question at the moment. I mean, f for deal, we know pretty much what it's probably going to look like, and we've done a lot of advanced planning as to, as to how we would handle that. For example, how we regulate medicines coming onto market and the uh, transfer of medicines between jurisdictions. No deal is much more problematic because almost by definition, nobody's done it before and we don't know where it is. Uh, there's been a lot of contingency planning undertaken. The Department of Health have opened now uh, a special unit in Brussels which will be responsible for transporting stents and other urgent medical supplies across. So we think we can continue to keep the thing running, but for how long? Nobody knows. Presumably it would be helpful to have a delay under a no deal uh, because uh, I mean Britain's been very late in organising any sort of preparations for a no deal scenario. Well I still think the chances of no deal are very low but as time goes on so the chance increases. Uh, the deal scenario of course allows a significant transition period through which much of these um, complex issues can be resolved. No deal is well straight off the edge of the cliff and into the unknown. Finally, can Britain and Australia learn much from each other on health? Oh, a huge amount. And by the way, we already do. We're, Britain and Australia are working very closely uh, on health. And I think there's much more to learn between those two countries than, say, Australia and the United States. I mean, at a scientific level, of course, the US is a fantastic leader. But how we organize healthcare and how we develop, in particular, this new digital agenda, there's activity going on already in the UK and in Australia, which is highly complementary. So, Malcolm, it's been a delight to talk. Thank you very much for joining me. A great pleasure. Thank you, Tiki. Interesting space. Yeah, that's all for the show tonight. Tomorrow night, a super Thursday of action. Alan Joyce on Qantas results, Kevin Gallagher on Santos results, Frank Calabria on Origin results, and ETF legend Graham Tuckwell's in town. Thanks for your company.